All right, guys, go ahead and turn to Joshua chapter four. I know generally speaking on communion nights, we do not go through uh, our midweek series, but tonight is a different kind of night. Tonight, um, as we go through Joshua chapter four, um, we are coming to a passage, we're coming to a passage tonight uh, that fits with communion so perfectly that I was excited to get into it. And the more I looked into it, the more I was convinced that this is exactly what we should be going through tonight. So now that you guys are in Joshua chapter four, go ahead and stand up. Go ahead and stand up as we read it together. All right, shh, guys, shh. I know it's hard to be quiet for like 15 minutes while we're praying, but... (laughs) All right, Joshua chapter four. We're gonna read the whole chapter together, 24 verses. Uh, And so I'm gonna start in chapter one. I would encourage you guys, have your Bible open in front of you, follow along um, as we go through this. And you guys will see um, why by the end of this, hopefully you'll see why that this fits so good, so well with communion. So let's begin reading. Joshua chapter four, verse one says, and it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, take for yourselves or for yourselves, 12 men from the people, one man from every tribe and command them saying, take for yourselves 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan from the place where the priest's foot stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. Each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them at the waters of the Jordan, or that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be a memorial for the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so. Just as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones from the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord had spoken to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them to the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. Then Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there to this day. So the priests who bore the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord had commanded Joshua speaking to the people according to all that Moses had commanded to Joshua and the people hurried and crossed over. Then it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over that the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed over in the presence of the people and the men, Reuben, the men of Gad, And half the tribe of Manasseh crossed over armed before the children of Israel as Moses had spoken to them. About 40,000 prepared for war crossed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel. And they feared him and they as they had feared Moses all the days of his life. Then the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, command the priests who bear the ark of the testimony to come up from the Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, come up from the Jordan. And it came to pass when the priests who had bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord had come from the midst of the Jordan and the soles of the priests' feet touched the dry land that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. Now the people came up from the Jordan in the 10th day of the first month, and they camped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. Then he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land. 
For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over as the Lord God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before you or before us until we had crossed over. And in verse 24, that all the people of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Father, we are so thankful that this is recorded tonight. God, teach us through the power of your spirit. Give us understanding in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. So if you're taking notes tonight, the title of the message is Memorials, Monuments, and Reminders. Memorials, Monuments, and Reminders. This is found in Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 24. If we were to take Joshua chapter 4 completely out of the Bible, you could actually read from Joshua chapter 3, that that narrative, you could jump right into chapter 5 and just keep going. There'd be no major pieces to the puzzle missing. You wouldn't be confused as to what's going on or what happened. And so that gives us an immediate question. That gave me an immediate question. If you can read from chapter 3, verse 17, and skip into chapter 5, verse 1, then why was Joshua chapter 4 recorded at all? That immediately becomes our question. Why record it at all if there's no absolutely necessary uh, details in that chapter. Well, we see the, ver- uh, the reason in chapter 6 and 7. Look back down in your Bibles at Joshua 6 and 7. Joshua 6 and 7 says, this is the reason that it's recorded. Look at what it says. That this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Look at verse 7. Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. All of chapter four is recorded for them and for us tonight so that they would not forget what God had done. That's why chapter four is recorded. And that's why the title of the message is Memorials, Monuments, and Reminders. Because the whole point of a memorial or a monument or some sort of reminder is so that you wouldn't forget something that happened or a person that lived. We see from chapter four that this was not just some stroll through the Jordan on a Sunday afternoon. This was a monumental event that the Lord did not want them or their children or their children's children to forget. It brings up the obvious idea that we are so prone to forget things. I know you guys are like me. I looked up the statistics today of different things about forgetfulness and our memories. And it's pretty crazy the different way our minds work and how quickly and how much we can forget so quickly. But we're so prone to forget. We're especially to pr- prone to forget what God has done for us and others. That there could be this whole long season of crying out to the Lord and crying out to the Lord and crying out and then he answers our prayer and as soon as the problem is gone, we forget. And then we move into another season with another problem that seems so big, we completely forget what God had done for us in the past. And so what God commands them here to do is not new at all. The Lord had actually given them other things to do in remembrance. Many of the feasts are examples of that. We see in Exodus chapter 12, verses 25 through 27. We're not going to look at it tonight, but if you want to write it down, Exodus 12, 25 through 27. It says that God instituted the Passover so that when their children ask, why do we do this? That they can tell them how God delivered them out of Egypt. That they were this little nation inside of a nation held power, held down by the power of the known world, and yet God delivered them on that Passover night, where not only did they get out, but the Pharaoh sent them out and said, go. And they took gold with them so that they looted Egypt without a single arrow being shot, without a sword being swung, God delivered them. There's a commentator named Dale Davis, and he has this quote. He says, we observe certain assumptions operating in Joshua 4, verses 1 through 10. 
Namely, that the greatest enemy of faith, listen, may be forgetfulness. That the greatest enemy of a strong faith may actually be forgetfulness. That we forgot what God had done for us in the past, and so because we forgot then, our confidence and our trust in God is not as strong as it should be now. Because ultimately, that's what faith is. It's a confident trust in God. And so the idea of this chapter is that God's past faithfulness should give Israel all the confidence in the world of his present persisting faithfulness. That God's past faithfulness should give us confidence of his present and persisting faithfulness. Not only that, but that we should seek to remember acts of his faithfulness. We should go out of our way to remember the things that God has done so that we don't forget. That's part of the reason God recorded the Bible for us. I know we've brought up this verse a couple times in going through Joshua, but it bears repeating. Romans 15, 4. The apostle Paul writes, for whatever things were written before, were written for our learning. The Apostle Paul says the entirety of the Old Testament, and now in our day and age, the entirety of the Bible, New Testament included, all of it that was written was written for our learning. Why? So that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. That as we look at what God did in the past, it gives us hope for now. That as we look at God's faithfulness to the children of Israel in crossing the Jordan, our problems don't seem so big now. We can have an absolute confidence that God is able to do anything that we ask him to do. The entirety of God's word is like one big arrow or one big sign that announces God is faithful. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end by simply communicating that God is faithful, but it actually begins there. His faithfulness should fill us with confidence to live the Christian life. And so tonight... As we go through our points, is the, is the PowerPoint not working, Viviana? Okay. So we don't have a PowerPoint, so you guys are going to have to stay on top of it, okay? Capiche? <laughs> All right, so our first point is this. You guys are lucky. I used one, point, one word points today, so you guys are, you guys are going to nail it. Yep, yep. Okay, memorials, monuments, and reminders. Our first point is this, intentional. Simply that. Point number one, write this down, intentional. We see this in verses one through three. We're going to see that the Lord is being intentional in what he is commanding Israel to go out of their way and do. He's commanding Israel to go out of their way to not forget what God has done for them. And I think as we talk about it tonight, we're gonna see that the same applies for us, that we should go out of our way to not forget. So look at verses one through three again with me says, it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from every tribe and command them saying, take for yourselves 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the, lo- in the place where you lodge tonight. And so the Lord has everyone cross completely over. Listen carefully. He has everyone cross completely over. It says that in verse one. So they cross all the way over, but then he sends 12 people back into the Jordan. For those of you guys who were here last week, remember we talked about those 12 random guys that Joshua picked out? And I said, we're gonna talk about them next week. Well, this is where those 12 random guys come back in. He gets these 12 guys, one from each tribe, and he says, go back into the Jordan. So think about this for a moment. They cross all the way over. The priests are still standing in the Jordan. The Jordan is still stopped. It's still dry. He says, you 12, go back. How would you like to be one of those 12? Not only do they have to cross once, they had to cross twice. It's like, what if, what if the water's coming? What if the thing, what if it doesn't work? And so he takes these 12 guys, sends them back to do what? To get 12 stones. These 12 stones become the focus of our chapter. Back in Joshua 3.12, we saw the Lord commanded to pull these 12 guys aside for a specific purpose. This chapter ultimately outlines, outlines why they were pulled aside. So we see 12 men, one from every tribe, and we see 12 stones. The whole nation is represented by these 12 men. And thus, they are in all the nation is invested in what God is commanding them to do. What God does is very intentional. 
one man from each tribe, not 10 and two, not 11 and one, not one from this, two from this, three from this, and then, sorry, Levi, or sorry, uh, Benjamin, you don't get any. No, what it is, is everybody is invested at this point because they all have a representative. The reason this is important is because in Deuteronomy chapter eight, in Deuteronomy chapter eight, God warns Israel not to forget what he had done and what he had said. Go back and read it later tonight. Deuteronomy 8, Moses, well, God speaking through Moses says, don't forget what I've done and don't forget what I've said. Now here in Joshua chapter four, God is going to give them an opportunity to be intentional as a nation and not to forget God's faithfulness. Erwin Lutzer says this, he says, we need more monuments of God's faithfulness. He mentions how we have monuments in Washington, D.C. We have monuments in every state capital. He said, I've been to hundreds of monuments of the things of this world. He says, we need more monuments of God's faithfulness. We need constant reminders of what God has done in the past to give us assurance that he will be here when we need him in the future. I think Erwin Lutzer's onto something. He's saying what so many historians have said, if you guys heard, that if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to what? Repeat it. And so he says, we have all these monuments so that we won't repeat the darkest times or, the, or we will repeat the best times in our history. But he says, we need more monuments to God's faithfulness. Cause me to think, how often do I think about the amazing things God has done in my life? How often do you take a moment to stop and think about the amazing things God has done for you personally? King David reminded himself of what God had done by talking to God about it. In Psalm 63, verses 6 through 8, Psalm 63, verses 6 through 8, King David says this. He says, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Verse 7, because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. David says, you've been my help. When I've needed help, God, you were there. And so God, as long as I'm with you, you guys know the picture of the shadow of the wings? It's like little, little chicks going to their mom and the mom covers them. One time we were at uh, Carbon Canyon uh, Regional Park and there was what I thought was a, a massively fat goose. I was like, that is a fat goose. That thing is huge. It looks like a turkey, right? And as we got closer, I noticed that its wings were moving and then out of it pops these little little baby geese. And they go running and, and mom goes over and follows them. And the idea is that mama was keeping those ones safe. They were in the shadow of her wings. And David says, God, you've been my help. And as he reminds himself that God has been faithful to help him, he says, God, I feel like I'm in the shadow of your wings. I feel like I'm close and I'm safe with you. David took the time in his present difficulty to remember God's past faithfulness. And in doing so, he was encouraged to keep moving forward into the future with confidence. So many of you guys filled out prayer requests, and this is no accident because I've never seen this so many, but so many of you guys filled out prayer requests about faith. I wanna grow in my faith, or I want a stronger faith. I don't wanna fall away. There was at least 10 or 12 of your prayer requests that were specifically about your faith. And so tonight, I hope you see the connection that we're making. That David's present difficulty did not weaken his faith. What it caused him to do was look back to God's past faithfulness to strengthen his faith. And so today, if you feel like your faith is waning, you need to look back. What has God done for you in the past? You need to be intentional about looking back at those things and say, you know what? God's past faithfulness should give me great confidence in the present. And so the Lord gives them the opportunity to be intentional in remembering the faithfulness of God in an impossible situation. And so too, tonight, we're gonna have the opportunity to be t intentional, but let's keep moving. Uh, point two, point number two is this, personal. Personal, verses four through nine. This is key because every tribe was invested in this memorial. It wasn't just a select group. It was every tribe through these 12 men. No one had the opportunity to rely on someone else's experience, but rather they got to experience it for themselves. Because they had a representative, it's almost like they were in the, the fight or they were in the match. You guys ever watched the Olympics before? 
Whenever I see an American competing in the Olympics, I don't care if it's like the shot put or speed skating in the Winter Olympics or a sport that I don't even like or know how, like I don't even know how the sport works. All I'm knowing is like, is the Americans winning? Is the US team winning? That's all I care about. I am so invested. It's especially difficult during the World Cup time of the year. And I watch the United States and we do pretty well until like the round of 16 and then we get demolished every single year. But because they're representing me, at least in my mind, they have my nation's flag on their shoulder or on their jersey, I feel invested. And so God takes these 12 guys and he makes it personal for each of them. And so in verses five and six, Joshua retells them what the Lord commanded them back in verses two and three. Ultimately, what we see is that this time, the children of Israel obeyed what God had commanded them to do. Last time, they came up to the Jordan, but were unwilling to go into the promised land, which caused them to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. We talked about that last week. But this time, they obey. And it shows us a principle, is that to see God's faithfulness, we must be living in a way that honors him. To see God's faithfulness, we must be living in a way that honors him. The first generation came out and they disobeyed and dishonored God by not entering the promised land. So what did they do? They wandered in the wilderness. Was God still faithful to them? Oh yeah, he was. He fed them day and night, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. But these ones, these ones who enter into the promised land, they saw God's faithfulness because they obeyed him. Which leads me to ask you tonight, as you look for God's faithfulness in your life, are you the reason that the blessing has been quenched? Are you tonight wandering in the wilderness of unbelief and disobedience? Well, if you are, then tonight would be the night to cling to God by faith, to say, God, I want to trust you. God, I want to see what you have for my life. And so to make it personal, he tells them, go in. And he says, each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder. That gives us the idea that it's not like a stone that you would skip across the the lake, but rather a big stone that they'd have to lift up and put over their shoulder. It was something for them to do personally. And it would make an occasion for the future generations to experience this moment for themselves. Look at verse six, Joshua chapter four, verse six. He says, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time come saying, what do these stones mean to you? And so they're supposed to take these 12 stones and they're gonna take, and in a little bit, it's gonna tell us that Joshua sets them up in the land of Gilgal. And it's supposed to be this monument of 12 stones. And the whole point is so that when the kids see it, when the children that were not present or maybe too young to remember crossing the Jordan, when they see those stones, they're going to look at mom or they're going to look at dad and say, what do these stones mean to you? Why is this here? It was to give the parents an opportunity to tell the future generation what God had done for them. And so this was not only for them who lived it. Now listen, this is important as we connect to tonight. This was not only important for those that were present, the ones that actually crossed over the Jordan. It was also for those who would experience that day through those stones. That the children that were born in the promised land after the crossing of the Jordan would be able to experience what Israel experienced personally through those stones. What do you mean? That as they look at those stones and as they hear the story as they're living in the promised land, they get to experience what happened in the past. That by faith and as they believe the story of their parents, as they look at those stones, they personally get to have the experience of believing it. And so in verse seven, Joshua goes on. He says, then you shall answer to them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off and these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel. Notice forever, forever. So that even those who did not see the Jordan stop would be able to experience that great miracle in looking at the stones. That as they look at the stones, that it's clear they came out from the middle of the Jordan, they would be able to, in a very real way, experience it for themselves. For every Israelite, 
Those stones were a memorial and a reminder of a reminder and a promise. It was a memorial of a reminder and a promise. A reminder of God's faithfulness and power, we've touched on that already, but a promise of the future faithfulness and power of God. And so too for us that believe, we should be able to look back at the entirety of the Bible and be reminded of the promises of God. There should be a very real way that as you guys read God's word, that you experience the things that these people experienced for yourself. That this book is like an entire set of memorial stones written one after the other that as you read them, you can personally experience the awesome power of God as you're made confident by the things written in the word. I want to be a little bit more specific. We should look at the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and be reminded of God's power and promises towards those who believe. That as we look back at the cross, that cross stands like these memorial stones stood. Because you and I did not see the empty tomb. Unless you've been to Israel, then you've seen it. You and I were not there like Thomas to touch his hands and his side. But as we look at the cross and as we hear from those who saw it firsthand, we also believe and experience it in the same way. This is not something that could be transferred to you by your mom or your dad, your brother or sister, husband or wife. This is something far more personal than that. And so I want to point you guys back to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, 13 through 14, where Jesus kind of hones in on this idea. In Matthew 16, 13 through 14, he's, it says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. There were lots of thoughts about who Jesus was or might be, but Jesus dialed in and got a little bit more specific. You guys know this well, but in the next verse, verse 15, he says this, who do you say that I am? He, he dials in and he points the finger at them and says, I'm not so worried about what they say. What do you say? Jesus cut right to the point. What is it that you say? Who do you say that I am? Ultimately, this is the primary question of all of life. There will never be a shoe-in into the kingdom of God. There will never be a shoe-in into heaven. You will not get there and say, oh, well, my parents were members of the church. You will not say, oh, but I hung out with all Christians. No. But my family was faithful to attend church every Sunday. That's not what gets you to heaven. There's nothing in this flesh, nothing on this earth that will shoo you into heaven. The ultimate question is this, who do you say that Jesus is? That's it. And so going back to Joshua, their testimony was to be general and personal. Listen carefully, because this is where the connection is made for the cross. Their testimony was to be general. That is, what did God do for the whole nation? God stopped up the Jordan so that the whole nation could march through. You guys following me? But it was also to be personal. What did God do for them personally? I want you to notice that they did not ask, what did God do for Israel? That's not what the children ask. The children ask, what do these stones mean to you? Mom, what do these stones mean to you? Dad? Dad? For us who are Christ followers tonight, we must recognize what Jesus did for us generally and personally. What did Jesus do for us generally? Well, that's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the general promise. That is the general thing that God had done for all the world. What did he do? He gave his only son so that whoever believes would not perish. But again, look at that question in verse six. Look down in your Bibles at verse six. The children ask, what do these stones mean to you? Not to them, not to us, to you. 
And so what has Christ done for us personally? Well, that's found in Galatians 2.20. In Galatians 2.20, the Apostle Paul says this famous verse. Most of you guys have it memorized. If you don't remember the address, you'll remember, you'll remember it as I start to say it. But he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. Listen carefully. Who loved me and gave himself for me. The Apostle Paul doesn't cling on to the general promise of Christ dying for the sins of the world, although that's true. What the Apostle Paul does is said, God loved me. And Jesus gave himself for me. He makes it personal. Have you recognized what God has done for you personally? It's not just that God saved the nation of Israel through the Jordan. It's that he saved individuals through the Jordan that made up the nation. In the same way, it's not that so God loved the whole world, although it's true. Don't hear what I'm not saying but it's that he loved and saved individuals within that whole world. And so tonight I would ask, have you made your faith in God personal? Do you own it? Because the children of Israel, though they all crossed through together, had to be prepared to answer the question, what does it mean to you? And you and I must be prepared to answer the question, who do you say that Jesus is? Which leads us to our third point, which is experiential. Go ahead and write that down. Experiential, verses 10 through 18. Now, Joshua describes to the children, he actually describes their crossing over. Okay, there was no more talking about it. It was actually time to move. So in verses 10 through 11, we see that the priests bore the ark and they stood in the midst of the Jordan until everyone, everything was finished. You skip down to verse 11. It says, the people hurried and crossed over. Then it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over that the ark of the Lord and the priests had crossed over in the presence of the people. And so the people put their feet to their faith. They put their feet to their faith and they actually cross over. It wasn't enough just to think about it. It wasn't enough just to talk about it. It wasn't enough just to want to cross over. Listen, it wasn't even enough to intend to cross over. Oh, I meant to do it. No, none of that was enough. They needed to put their feet to their faith and actually do what God commanded them to do. That's what I mean by experiential. They actually had to do it. In James 2.18, it says, but someone will say, I have faith, or you have faith and I have works. James, in his famous quote, says, show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. James doesn't say, oh yeah, I have faith, and then has nothing to prove. James says, not only do I have faith, I'm going to show you by my experience, meaning I'm actually going to live it out before you. And these children of Israel had the opportunity that was brought to them where they had to experience the promise. They had to actually go do it. And so they did it. They actually lived what they said they believed. And so in, in Joshua 4, 12 and 13, we're going to go through it quickly, but it talks about Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh. There was an agreement set up by Moses in Numbers 32 that these three tribes would go over before the children of Israel because they had taken their inheritance on the other side of the Jordan. And so Moses said, okay, deal. We have a deal, but you guys have to go fight first. And they did. And so God did just as he said he would. And then in verses 15 through 18, Joshua retells the story of the priests coming up from the Jordan. But I want you to look at the, verse, the end of verse 18, because 15 through 18 is him retelling the story. But look at the end of verse 18 with me. It says that the soles of the priest's feet touched the dry land, that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. And so what he's saying is that the moment the priests stepped out of the riverbed, the water flooded back into place. And it was just in case anybody thought that there was some sort of natural explanation, the Lord times it perfectly so that as soon as the priests step out, the water comes in. 
God's timing is always perfect. He's the sovereign ruler over circumstances, and our circumstances are never outside of his control. And so all those that were present that day were there to share their experience with those who were to come. And so through their testimony, that others would experience it as they walk as well. We actually see the same thing in the New Testament. Write down 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. 1 John 1, 1 through 4 is almost like a New Testament equivalent to this idea of memorial stones and experiencing something through the testimony of another. John says, that which was from the beginning, listen, that to which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes and looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested. We have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested to us. John says, we've heard it, we've seen it, We've touched it with our hands that the eternal life that dwelled with God forever was made real before our very eyes. Verse three, he says, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. Why are you telling us this, John? That you may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. These things I write to you that your joy may be full. John essentially says the same thing. We heard Jesus speak, we saw Jesus lived, we touched him with our hands. We walked with him, we heard him teach, we saw the miracles, we saw the dead raised up, the lepers cleansed, the blind, the blind to see, the lame to walk, we saw it all. And the whole reason I'm telling you is so that you can also experience life with Christ. That's why he told us. And so in the same way, the children of Israel were to erect these stones and say, these are here so that you can experience what we have seen with our eyes by faith. And so the apostle John shares the same idea. The children, this is the danger, that the children would hear it as just a story. This is why I'm against calling them Bible stories. With my kids, I never say Bible story because I don't want them to ever like make it equal to Jack and the Beanstalk or Clifford or Curious George. Those are stories. These are historical accounts that actually happened. And so I want to be clear. When I'm talking about experience, I'm not talking about goosebumps. I'm not talking about weirdness. I'm not talking about someone swooping their coat at you and you falling on the floor, passed out. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is way more real than any of those things. What I'm talking about is having true fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, knowing God personally. And so I'd ask you, do you see God at work in your life? Do you personally have fellowship with Him? As you read His Word, does He speak to you? As you pray, does He lead you in the way that you should go? Do you have a constant reminder, a constant just knowing that God is ever present with you? Do you fellowship with him that way? Have you experienced God in that way? The children of Israel were able to share that experience, which brings us to our fourth and final point, which is this, purposeful. Simply that, purposeful. We see this in verses 19 through 24. The memorial stones had a specific purpose and end. They were to show Israel and really the entire world God's mighty hand and cause all to fear the Lord. That was the goal. And so as they came up out of the... Jordan, they ended up in Gilgal. In the city of Gilgal, that's where they built their 12 stones, their monument. This is about eight miles from the Jordan and it sits on the border of Jericho. Gilgal became a key city throughout Israel's history, but in Joshua's days, they would gather there often. Now listen, because this is gonna bring us to communion tonight. In Joshua's day, they would go back to Gilgal often. Sometimes they would go there after victory. Sometimes they would go there after defeat. It became sort of a supply city where they would go quite often. And every time they went there, what do you think they saw? Every time they went there, what do you think they saw? The monument, the stones. And so they kept going back and they kept seeing these stones. And if they were discouraged from a defeat, they'd be reminded of God's faithfulness in the past and his power. If they were excited about a victory, they would be reminded that it was God who gives the victory, not you. And in verse 24, 
God gives the reason for these stones. He says that all the people of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it's mighty, that they or that you may fear the Lord your God forever. This was to bring others to see the power of God. And so you might ask, what does this mean for, here, for me here tonight? Well, it actually serves a very practical purpose for us tonight. For us to remind ourselves of God's faithfulness often. We are to be reminded of God's faithfulness over and over, just like the children of Israel returned to Gilgal and they went back and they saw those stones. We should have something in our life that purposely brings us back to the cross. There should be something in our lives that brings us back to the cross to remember what God did in the past is a promise for future or for present power and faithfulness. That God's power to forgive in the past is actually the reminder that he's, he's willing to forgive you now for whatever you've fallen short in. And so Dave Ralph Davis says this, talking about Joshua 4, he says the pattern of remembrance carries over for the church. We continue to remember the utterly unique act of our Redeemer in the Lord's Supper, communion. He says, why this remembrance? Lest we begin to regard the cross as a piece of furniture or jewelry, rather than the throne of the shepherd who soaked up the wrath of God for the sins of his flock. What Mr. Davis is saying is that this picture in Joshua 4 is fully fulfilled in us tonight. How? Tonight as we come to communion, the the worship team can come out. Tonight as we come and gather for communion, we're not going to take a trip to Gilgal. That's not where we're going tonight. Instead, we're going to go to Calvary. We're together as a group. We're going to go to Calvary because Jesus instituted a memorial for us to continue even tonight. In 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26, the Apostle Paul spoke about this. He said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken. Listen, Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For often, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As often as we do communion together, we do this in remembrance of Jesus. And what we do is we are proclaiming his death till he comes. Just like the children of Israel were to proclaim what God did in that Jordan in that day, as we partake of communion, we have our own Gilgal with our own set of stones that we go to today. And so our four points as it applies to communion. Communion is intentional. Jesus did not give us the option as believers in Christ, but he said, as often as you do this. Not if you do, but as often as you do. The next thing he said is communion is personal. We see that only the believer is able to take communion. And so the question is tonight, have you given your life to Jesus Christ? And are you walking with him? Do not take communion tonight if you're not a believer in Christ, and do not take communion tonight if there's unrepentant sin in your life. Now, the good news for those of you who are believers, even if there's unrepentant sin, you can come to the cross, you could do business tonight, and then take communion in remembrance of what God has done for you. But don't take communion until you've done that. So it's personal. The next thing is that a communion is experiential. This is for for those who have experienced the forgiveness of sin, and I'm not talking about the feeling. I'm talking about faith. Because the Bible says that even if our own hearts condemn us, that God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Have you experienced that walk with God? Brings us to our last thing and where we close. Communion is purposeful. As we've come together tonight to be reminded, we've come together to be reminded of the central point in all of human history. The redemption of lost humanity by Jesus on the cross. That is the absolute center and pinnacle of human history. The moment that Jesus purchased redemption for you and I. And so there's a purpose to communion tonight. And so tonight, as the the worship team plays, you guys can go back and partake of communion as you feel led. But I want to encourage you guys tonight to take a moment before that 
and as it were, take a trip to Gilgal. Go back there and, and take a moment to go back in your life and look at God's past faithfulness if you're feeling discouraged. If you're feeling encouraged, if you're walking with God and everything's awesome, make sure you set up memorial stones tonight. That you plot this day in your mind lest you forget. Let's pray. Father, God, we come to you tonight. Lord, and I'm thankful that Gilgal is not just for the children of Israel. Of course, Lord, there's no stones in this room. We don't have a, a monument here tonight. We are not uh, gathered around a memorial. But Lord, as we come together and partake of communion together, God, we must admit, we must see, God, the picture that you have told your people to be reminded often of what you've done in the past. And so God, as we sing and as we partake of communion together, may you remind us tonight of all the good that you've done in our lives. We love you. God, we thank you. God, and I pray that if there's any student in here tonight that's not right with you, that they would make it right and then partake of communion as a memorial tonight that their sins are forgiven because of what Jesus has done. So God, we give ourselves and this time to you tonight in Jesus' name.